Adina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship. Mile. Thank you. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Uh, this is uh, Norm Smallwood, and uh, I'm here with uh, my colleague Joe Hansen uh, from the RBL Group. It's uh, as, as uh, we said, we're in uh, in Utah today, and uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, we've got a Saudi Aramco team here in in Park City for two weeks at a leadership uh, conference that we're running. So. Feel very close to you today here with uh, with with that group here, so uh, working with us. Uh, well, we're excited today to present our our, our insights about how to in, embed and build a innovation capability in your organization. Uh, we've done uh, work for many years in uh, primarily in the UAE and Saudi and and Oman and uh, have uh, lots of good friends and, and they're familiar with uh, many of the client organizations that we've worked with over the last uh, eight to ten years. Um, today, Joe and I are going to cover three critical factors which are uh, really interdependent and need to be built in order to increase the amount of innovation that you have in your organization. The first area that we're going to cover is the leader's role in, in building innovation. Uh, I'll talk about that, and then Joe's going to talk about uh, how to design your organization for better innovation. What is it about how some organizations uh, create a platform for innovation that sustains versus, uh, versus others who don't have as much luck? And then finally, uh, and possibly the most interesting of the, the three topics is the individual level. What can we do to become more innovative? How can we uh, think and then act more innovatively? Um, so this uh, next slide here looks at uh, the leader's role in increasing value in the organization. and. Uh, <clears throat> And if you're a publicly traded company, you've, you've likely experienced this uh, shift in what drives market value. If you look over on the bottom left, in 1977, earnings or financial results were, were king. Um, a company's stock price was directly related to its financial earnings. And yet here we are. Uh, 40 years later almost, and we're living in a world in which those financial results uh, on average across all industries account for only about half of market value. So the question is, what what is it that has changed? So under the graph, you've got uh, your confidence in your track record. So that's uh, your ability to deliver your your earnings, your financial results, and then the, the, the part above, the value that has shifted, which is the value that is no longer just earnings, has to do about with uh, investor confidence in your future. And those are things uh, that uh, we'll, we'll take a little bit uh, deeper look at here. And the, the most important question is, what is it that a company can do with uh, that that uh, wants to increase and have higher levels of confidence in its future? Um, and, and and so if we take a look at this next slide here, um, we'll, we'll see why that's so important. So what we've done here is we've taken a number of leading companies and then. Uh, looked at their price to earnings ratio over the last 10 years. So the earnings is their financial results, and then the price is really the price of their stock. So really the, the price to earnings multiple is the difference between what their earnings are for the year and what the price of the stock is. So in some of these companies, if you go down to the bottom and look at uh, Pepsi, for example, Pepsi also uh, uh, has a, a team of leaders here at our conference in Utah, but uh, Pepsi has a P-E ratio for the last 10 years that averages about 19.4, and then, again, you almost have to look at this on an industry basis. 
because uh, the factors driving confidence and the the how how high the PE ratio can go are actually governed by the industry you're in. But if you look within your same industry, you can see that Pepsi uh, is competing against a group of companies whose PE is about 17.43. So so whatever it is that Pepsi is doing. They've got more investor confidence than the average in their in their industry. It's about 12 percent more. That's uh, the difference between the 19.4 and the 17.43. And since Pepsi has a market capitalization of 128 billion, that translates to a value premium of about 13 billion dollars. So the question is, what is it that is going on at Pepsi that's creating this uh, this premium in their value, and then we'll tie that to innovation. Well, in earlier work that we've done, we've we've looked at how leaders in some companies have been able to increase the amount of confidence in their future, and they do that by aligning these four components: the architecture for intangible. And so I'll just go through these quickly, and uh, on, the, on the top right, we'll, we'll see where innovation really begins to, to play a role here. But uh, the first thing that any leader needs to do if they want to increase confidence in their future is to deliver on their financial promises. Once you, you can't get any premium if your earnings promises are up and down, so you have to, to stabilize those and get confidence. Those are the table stakes to uh, increasing value. Once you've got that, the next step is to have a compelling strategy. And leaders need to be able to describe how their company is going to grow profitably in the future. Are we going to do it through product innovation? Are we going to do it through selling more to existing customers? Are we going to grow geographically? But that uh, growth strategy has to be clear and has to be articulated over and over again to, uh, to stakeholders of the organization. The third level is to align technical core competencies. In other words, all work is not created equal. And in a few minutes, Joe's going to show how some leading and innovative companies have invested in their technical core competencies in different ways to organize to to create really sustainable innovation. So if, in other words, if your growth is going to be through product innovation, your your technical core competencies will be different than the kind of innovation you need if you've got a customer or market segmentation that uh, where you're trying to sell more to an existing set of customers. And then finally, we, we, we get to the organization capabilities. And the organization capabilities are the our collective social DNA. It's, uh, it's our culture. It's what makes us unique because of our people and, and the way we're organized. And again, there's a number of things that these could be, but innovation is one that is is often chosen as a key organizational capability that if focused on and designed for and invested in can make a huge difference uh, uh, to your company's results. So um, what I'm going to do now is basically I've, I've, I've set this up to say there's three areas we're going to cover. We're going to look at the role of the leader. We're going to look at the role of organization design for innovation, and then the individual side. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe to talk about uh, the design implications here. Okay, thank you, Norm, and thank you to Ali and Raveda for, and the Medina Institute for hosting us again. It's been my personal thanks. It's been a delight working with you and setting this up. And I want to make the transition as well. If, again, we said half of the, half of the value um, financially, it, in a public company, is driven from these first two: keeping promises and compelling strategy. And if we're saying the other 50% of the value in a company, right, is driven by um, confidence in organization capability in the future, 
what is it about the technical core competencies and organizational capabilities in a company that really makes a difference? And as, we, as we've studied this, we've, we've, we've wondered and, and explored this and worked with several companies around, is there a way to design the company now that get, increases your chance to improve confidence for um, the investor and, in this case, specific to innovation, allow you to be more successful in innovation? And uh, we're really excited to talk about this. We, we love doing this kind of work with organizations. and and believe there's a huge impact um, on this ability to design um, the organization to allow your teams and individuals to flourish um, in what they want to be doing individually. So when you look at um, innovation as a strategic capability, right? you look at these kind of companies that pop up on the board here, and they're all very well-recognized companies, and these were voted uh, the Fast Company's most innovative, com innovative companies. And the, the trick about this is this is just not a one-shot deal, right? These guys have proven innovation over years and years, and they continue to do that. And we're going to pick two of these, Samsung on the right and Amazon, and show um, a high-level insight around how they think about technical core competencies and um, design of organization process that really facilitates their innovation. Um, as a backdrop, let's, let's um, start with understanding three different company strategy types. And, and this is not like the market, market customer strategy. This is, for our view, organization strategy that integrates all of the, the go-to-market and the implementation side of a company. There's three ways you can think about organizing your company from a strategy perspective. One is a product service, where um, in the case of Samsung and Ford, they sell basic products and lots of variations of those, but every time you, you buy something, it's a product. So the question is, how do they find more customers for their product? And how do you be successful driving that product? The second one is customer market. And this is the case of Nike or Disney where they focus on a specific subset of customers, Disney, family entertainment, entertainment, Nike, the athlete within us. Um, and how do we meet more of the customer needs as their organizational imperative? Can we provide more products and solutions to families or athletes to be competitively advantaged against other players? The third is the process. Uh, kind of organization. And this could be a technology process, a capacity like a Rio Tinto that has uh, the world's largest mines or distribution where your, your whole goal is to improve capacity and throughput and unit cost and to drive as many products and services through that, that system that fit and, and um, you know, as possible as you can do, as many as you can do that fit these system constraints. Amazon and Marriott are good examples of that. Marriott's interesting. They build hotels and you have buildings all over the world. You have to keep them full of happy customers. So how, how do you keep that throughput going? Amazon, uh, as an online retailer, has demonstrated the ability to put enormous uh, capacity through their distribution system. So we'll look at uh, in a little more detail now, Samsung and <clears throat> Amazon. If you look at Samsung and the competition in smartphones, five years ago, you could only buy a Nokia phone. Right? They flooded the market. Um, they've now moved to a fringe player, um, become a fringe player because they were just overwhelmed by the smartphone. And who's the, who's the leading winner You know, coming from behind? And five years ago, it's Samsung. They've moved from appliances to the market share leader in smart devices. And now we're challenging Apple, Apple really for the leading role in innovation. Uh, so a very impressive uh, track for Samsung. When you look at Samsung and what their strategic design, they're looking at innovation through products and an innovation product platform. So when you look at product, what drives a product platform organizationally? 
Well, these are the kinds of processes that a world-class product company would have, the product solution specifications, being able to identify exactly what the product needs to do, designing the product, um, then looking at the product into different market applications, being able to take it to different markets and different features. Um, in the case of Samsung, they have hundreds of products, and so they have a very uh, sophisticated portfolio management capability where you enter new products and you exit older products and you manage the whole life cycle. And then there's a product service around um, servicing the bundle of products you have. What their goal is in this organization with their innovation is to have the most innovative array of product offerings. And they're going to be product life cycle experts. We manage introductions and exits smartly. Um, now let's contrast that with uh, Amazon. Now if you look at the competition on online wheeling, retailing, a couple of examples would be Virgin Megastore and HMB. Um, that, that sprouted up several years ago and were big splashes. Um, Virgin has closed almost all of the stores in the UK and Europe. They have stores of, available still in the Middle East, but they're losing share. HMB is in a, in a bankruptcy receivership trying to redefine itself. And in the same time, Amazon has exploded onto the world marketplace. Uh, they began in eight, 19, actually 1988 as an online bookseller. They've had a continuous stream of innovation now to where they sell 100 million items through their distribution system, and they're now exploring with drone delivery. Right, they'll drop it on your doorstep uh, from a drone. Um, what makes Amazon um, so successful from an organization capability around um, this model, and it's, it's really innovation around core distribution processes, and you'll see this is very different than Samsung. Amazon looks at um, the strategic alliance management. We need to have um, relationships with hundreds of thousands of superior vendors, and in this case, it doesn't even matter if they sell one or two or a hundred thousand. We can make it successful digitally, you know, with the digital commerce to our, our uh, system. Then in the next two, we, we develop the most sophisticated distribution system and management of that system um, for throughput, capacity, and reliability, and cost. We can do that better than anybody, any other retailer. Market and product solution portfolio says we're looking constantly looking for new ways to innovate uh, market applications and new solutions, and then the demand is how do we how do we sell those solutions into the marketplace? So their capability, right in in the red box there, is we are more effective and efficient than any competitor, and we are more proficient at designing and selling new solutions that fit our distribution system. <laughs> so if you look at um, the contrast. Right, these are both winners in their industries, and they're designed completely differently. Samsung is a product platform and a life cycle player, um, driving uh, an array of similar products and solutions, and then a portfolio management around those solutions. Amazon is all about alliance of distribution solution platforms that can be more more competitive um, to, to send thousands of products that are unlike, uh, that are this similar. Uh, Samsung has similar products around their smartphones. Amazon can sell hundreds of thousands of products that are dissimilar to the same distribution system um, and, and more than anyone else in the world. So this highlights that for us the differing strategies require different innovation driven by unique process design. So Amazon is going to be innovating around um, these parts of their core capabilities. So tying back to what Norm said, what are the technical core competencies and capabilities and cap uh, that, that drive the competence in the future? For Amazon, it would be these five. 
they'll be innovating around distributions, new, new vendors, new product applications, and Samsung will be innovating around product design, new product app features and applications around the smartphones, and then can we increase a competitive portfolio of, of uh, products and services to beat Apple. So that's, that's the second um, piece in the equation for successful innovation. One is, again, the leader setting up a, a model where they can focus on capabilities and um, core competencies and manage uh, confidence from existing earnings. Then we said the second piece was, how does a leader then design the organization? How do you get an organization to design these kind of capabilities and implement them over time? That third piece would be, now you have individuals and teams actually doing the work. How do you help them be successful in doing your innovation? And Norm's going to talk about the entry to that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Joe. So as, as Joe said, we have, uh, we've looked at the leader's role. We've looked at designing uh, an organization that drives innovation, and now um, you know, how can you get every individual in the organization to increase their creativity and innovation capability? And uh, we have partnered with uh, uh, a guy named Jeff Dyer, who wrote a book with uh, Clayton Christensen, the, uh, the Harvard Business School professor that wrote The Innovator's DNA. Jeff and uh, Clay and a guy named Hal Gregerson at INSEAD uh, wrote a book called uh, The Innovator's DNA. And in The Innovator's DNA, they take a, a close look at uh, not only what's different about innovators from non-innovators, but also what are some key ways, some key skills that you can build to increase your ability to be more innovative. And basically, the idea here is that successful innovators have the ability to question, observe, experiment, and network. And then they can pull across from those different uh, skill sets, in, uh, questioning, observing, experimenting, and networking, to generate creative ideas. So let's look at how that plays out. So here's, uh, here's a, what I think is a fascinating chart where the Jeff and Clay and Hal <clears throat> wrote the innovator's DNA, looked at the, the, the line across the bottom at about the 40th to 50th percentile is a group of, <clears throat> excuse me, is a group of CEOs uh, who are non-founders of their companies in average and, and are running average performing companies. So average performers and non-founders. And, and look at their skills. So their skills in associating, questioning, observing, experimenting, and networking average the, to the 40th to 50th percentile, usually below the 50th percentile. Now if you compare that to the scores of <clears throat> of some founders of very innovative companies, uh, Mike Lazidoris, uh, who founded BlackBerry. Uh, BlackBerry has sort of suffered the same uh, problems that Nokia has in that they <clears throat> haven't continued their innovation journey and uh, have done a downward cycle, but for a period of time, BlackBerry invented this uh, smartphone market, and uh, and and obviously the mic skills there uh, are fairly self-evident. Pierre at uh, eBay, Scott Cook at Intuit, and uh, Michael Dell at uh, at Dell um, all show a very different uh, profile around each of these areas. And so, uh, with that, Joe's going to get in and talk about. What are some ways that we can actually build each of these skills? So what are they and what are some ways that we can increase how we, uh, we utilize them? Okay. 
So let's um, let's talk about each one of these uh, for a little bit, just to get a sense of, of what this means. Associating is is connecting things that are. So it's connecting uh, apparently seemingly unrelated kinds of things in your own experience and views and applying them to a problem solving uh, mode with your product. The next one's questioning, right? And so a lot of people have natural abilities to question um, the status quo and challenge the status quo. David Nealman, who's the founder of JetBlue and Azul Island uh, Airlines, this would be equivalent in the Middle East to fly Dubai. He, he figured out a, a niche, uh, low-cost niche, but as opposed to um, kind of old planes that didn't and didn't match or run very well, he had very new, nice planes with TV screens on them and um, a very pleasant experience, and. He, he says one of his strengths is the ability to look at a process and just ask, why don't they do it this other way? And why has no one ever thought of this before? He, he, he relates early on that, um, and I can appreciate this from working at a couple of airlines, they used to have the paper tickets um, that were like money. If you lost them, you know, they were value lost. and and if you got to a plane and you didn't, or a check-in and you didn't have your ticket, you were sunk. He, he kept asking the question, why does it have to be this way? Why can't we do this digitally or remotely or through a computer? Who has, why do we have to carry paper? And early on in his career, he, he helped invent one of the first uh, paperless tickets. And that ability and questioning ability eventually led him to say, why do I have to <clears throat> fly the airlines the way they're configured and can't I build an airline the way I want to fly that's uh, cheap and nice and, and gets me there on time. Uh, observing is the next one. So we've, we've talked about associating, collecting, connecting all of the experiences and disparate um, views into a problem. Um, we've talked about questioning. Uh, why does it have to be this way? The next skill is observing. And this is just being able to understand and um, articulate and notice, you know, the world around you, customers, products, services, to gain insights about and new ideas about um, doing things. Um, one of the interesting examples there was Scott um, Cook at um, Intuit, I, the way he got the idea for Intuit, which is, if you haven't used it, it's QuickBooks, it's a financial software, tax planning. He and his wife were uh, struggling early in their careers, and, and um, he would observe her periodically struggling to keep track of her finances, and she would be preparing on a, on a paper or, or all these receipts. 
kind of like Norm and I still do, right? um, and struggling to be able to put, compile information that would um, make sense for her tax accountant. He looked at that and said, that's really such a waste of time for my wife and what she needs to be doing. Can't there be a better way to do this? So he, he observed and then he questioned. And out of that <clears throat> simple observation, he, he developed into it and um, now is one of the most innovative companies around financial services uh, software. Um, the next one is experimenting. And, and this is um, taking business ideas or um, concepts and being able to try them out in new places, new things, new information to pilot and test hypotheses. And um, you can think about this within your organization. How, how confident do we think our employees feel in trying new ideas and experimenting? This is something that is, is uh, extremely important as a, a capability and as an organization uh, culture to allow people to take the insights, the observations, the questioning, and then actually experiment them. One of the, the, the greatest innovator experimenters is uh, Sir Richard Branson right, in the UK, who has launched over 300 virgin companies. Right? And, and he started out in the music business. He said, I got tired of flying British Air. Can't I create a new airline? He, he thinks boldly there's got to be a way to um, have, have a better service experience and a more fun and dynamic experience than the airlines. Um, right? He said, I'm prepared to try anything once. And uh, you know, a favorite quote is, I'll throw mud on the wall and, th and see if it sticks. Now, <clears throat> behind him, right, are as, as many companies that didn't succeed, actually probably more companies that didn't succeed than those that succeeded, but he was willing to try anything. Um, the last one is networking. Finding and testing ideas with a network of individuals who are diverse and um, and have different perspectives. So if we think about, if, if you were to list your top 10 people that would be go-to people to help you generate a spark of new ideas, how, who would those be and how, or how many could you list? And in the research, they found that many, many people um, that were, were more of the average or below average innovators, they couldn't list anybody, which meant they only looked at themselves for ideas. In companies, um, if you put a group of people and ask this question, who are the top 10 go-to, you tend to have the same people. Right? They're all referring to um, kind of high-profile or experienced people that everybody knows, and they coalesce around the same 10 people. And the highly innovative companies and the, those who are successful in innovating have a different model Right. They tend to think about networking and di as diversity. The more um, you can surround yourself and link and integrate with people that are very different, either in a different function, um, a different geographic location, different native language, someone 18 years or younger, someone 75 years or older, how much diversity you can get and you have in your network tends to drive the ability to, to search for new ideas and, and uh, applications. So Pierre at eBay, right, I really look for insights from unusual places. I'd rather talk to someone in the mailroom than the CEO. Right? And um, that's interesting. So he's, he's seeking top to bottom, side to side, inside, outside. Um, for networking ideas in eBay. And if you look at the history of eBay, they innovated a whole new platform. They stalled in their growth, and they realized they didn't have enough innovation, and they didn't have enough capability inside to do the innovation. So they went and bought about 80 startup technology companies 
that were founded by extreme innovators. And they brought these folks into the organization with their innovation, and they let them loose. Um, they needed to design a new customer uh, interface on their computer, and they took one of these innovators, gave them a checkbook, and free reign for uh, however long it took. This person got six people that in the company that, that, that he wanted, flew them to Australia without anybody knowing in the company where they were. And in the next month, they designed the, the next uh, level interface of, of the eBay platform. And when he came back, um, the president asked him, well, how are you doing? And he said, well, we've got it done. Let me show you what it looks like. And um, so that was a, a combination of all of this kind of, uh, when you think about the innovation and innovation, innovative organization, right, networking, bringing people in from outside, giving a team the ability to observe, question, experiment, and a free reign to associate all of their experience into a new platform. It's a great example of uh, being able to do um, and then a new innovation very quickly. Um, so in summary, right, the individual skill set which sets these innovators apart, as Norm showed clearly on that graphic earlier, is a combination of, of questioning, observing, experimenting, and networking, and then creating associations from all of that experience and data that can drive new ideas um, in your organization. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up. We'll make an invitation, and then uh, we'd love to have some uh, Q&A with you. But, uh, you know, what we've covered is uh, three areas today, how leaders increase value through innovation. And we, we've talked about leaders have a key role in driving confidence in the future, both with external and internal stakeholders. And the way that they do that is that they deliver financial results. They, they have a strategy. Joe talked about uh, three kinds of strategy, product, customer, and process. And then given that strategy, they, they identify a, the, the core technology platform and then the social organization capabilities that really become our culture that, uh, that, that underpin our innovation uh, ability and confidence in, in our future. We also talked about uh, designing for innovation. We talked about uh, Amazon and Samsung and with very different strategies. Samsung with a product strategy, uh, Amazon with a process distribution strategy identified very different technical capabilities that drove very different kinds of organization designs that, uh, that, that result in, in very innovative companies, but in different ways. So there's not just uh, one size fits all. There has to be an alignment with what you're trying to do. And then we ended up here talking about how do individuals become more innovative? Because uh, uh, all of this isn't uh, going to work unless uh, we, we really focus ourselves on, on investing in ourselves to, uh, to, to learn these skills of associating, questioning, observing, experimenting, and networking. Um, if you'd like to learn more, I mean, this is uh, uh, obviously we, we've touched the surface of these topics, but uh, we're holding a, a three-day uh, innovation workshop, which is going to be held in Dubai, November 18th to the 20th. And uh, if, if this is the kind of thing that interests your company and you'd like to uh, learn more about it, we'd, we'd love to see you in Dubai. I'd love to have a team of, uh, from, from your organization come and, uh, and, and apply the, uh, the ideas we're talking about. The, the intent of uh, this innovation workshop is for companies to send a team and to have a project Something, some challenge around uh, how they would like to increase innovation, and by using the kinds of methodology and tools that we've uh, we've highlighted today, that you would return from this workshop 
with some very concrete applications back to your organization. The other thing that uh, we'd invite you to look at is uh, we showed the the results of these different innovators in terms of their skills across the five areas, uh, questioning, observing, networking, and so on. If you'd like to take an online survey, uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, we, we'd love to, let, let us know and we'd love that we can uh, organize uh, an opportunity for you to take that. Again, sometimes it's interesting to uh, to take that individually and see where you stand. It's also interesting for teams in your organization, in R&D and HR and finance and so on, to collectively aggregate their their skills in, the, in those areas and say, what are the areas of strength and potential uh, weakness that we might have in terms of uh, our innovative ability? Um, so I, 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 uh, I don't know if on other parts of the presentation that we've set out you know how to contact us, but our, the website is rbl.net, and uh, Joe and I have our contact information uh, up here for you to see, and if, if you'd be interested in learning more, we'd, we'd love to uh, talk. Mine is in smallwood at rbl.net, and Joe's is jhanson at rbl.net. We've enjoyed the opportunity of, uh, of highlighting some of these uh, innovation ideas, how to, how to embed innovation in your organization. And now we'd like to give it some time for some uh, questions. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for a very intriguing presentation. Folks, we are now open for a Q&A. If you have any questions, you could put it in the question box or you could raise your hand and I'll give you an opportunity to speak. Uh, let me go straight to the first caller. As usual, we have Dr. Muhammad. Could you please introduce and ask the question, sir? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Norm and Joe, for uh, such a fantastic, fantastic presentation on innovation. And uh, I had uh, two quick questions. Uh, the, the first one was like you talked about certain criteria or parameters which will uh, trigger more of innovation. So can it be uh, one of the criteria? Can we change? You know, change tries to bring triggers into innovation. For example, I have some reason for that. Like Apple uh, thought of uh, getting hiring someone from Burberry, which is a British uh, luxury uh, merchandising organization, because from luxury, that top management going to the electronics. The second one is the Procter and Gamble uh, taking up Gillette. Uh, Procter and Gamble being a household kind of uh, organization having products and then drill it more on male aftershave products. So change that uh, may think of having some kind of innovation. So uh, this is my first question. And uh, the second question is that I'm, into, I'm a professor, so uh, perhaps there's an irony here that we professors, we, we want to have expectation that the students should be more creative, they should be more innovative, they should have new ideas, new way of doing things, and perhaps the irony is that our we professors, in general, not specific any place, that we have the same curriculum, same way of teaching, etc. So uh, these are two of my comments. Thank you very much. Sure, I'll, I'll tackle the first one, and thanks for being with us today. Certainly, change is a critical piece of this, um, and, and managing change, and that becomes. Uh, it, you know, critical organizational capability is part of uh, investors' confidence in your future. When you think about um, the massive amount of change Samsung's undergone, right, or Amazon's undergone in the past um, five years, um, what 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 they developed is not not a, a a need around changing their business model or changing because they have a crisis. They've been able to take change as a capability uh, and a directive and a constructive change around their product or around innovation. Right? They've they've welcomed innovation. They they welcome change and new ideas and innovation. So, if in in that regard, to continue your capability, you have to be very adept at change. Um, on the other side, P and G. You mentioned P and G. Five, six years ago, they had stagnated in their growth, and they brought in a new chairman. And what did he do? He put in a bunch of, of, of 
criteria and directives and mandates and goals that required P&G to change. And it was all around innovation, right? They said, we're going to be the most innovative um, um, uh, company in this industry. And in fact, in the research with Jeff Dyer and Clayton Christensen, they're one of their high, hyper, highest performing innovation premium companies. When Norm talked about the, the price earnings premium that that's driven from innovation, P&G had like had a 38% premium because of all the innovation they've done in the last, um, over the last five, six years. And that's because you had a chairman that came in and said, we don't, we're going to change the way we do this and, and put the strategies in place and more importantly, the metrics around measuring percent of revenue from new products and services. Um, so when we look at those three elements we talked about, right, it's a leader, um, setting those expectations and driving change, and then are they designing the right parts of the organization and putting the right pieces to help manage that change to where they want to get to? That'd be our our um, our view on change. Thank you. Norm will take the other question. Yeah, the other question was just about uh, how universities have. If I was to summarize the the question, I I don't know if it was a question or a comment, but. But if I was to summarize it, I, I, I agree with the sentiment, at least, which is that uh, if you look at business schools, for example, uh, business schools tend to be set up in a very siloed way. You know, you've got a strategy, finance, marketing, organization. So we, we, we silo them uh, while they go through their educational experience. And then they come out into business, and we want them to work as teams and cross and so on. And sometimes we're surprised that we educate them in silos, and then when they come into the uh, into the business world or the working world, then they tend to be more siloed. Um, even the research that goes on about how to do things is is often very siloed. So there are a few universities that uh, that that actually are, are experimenting on how to do that differently. That the one that comes to mind first is the Duke's MBA program where the students are put in teams at the very beginning of the year and uh, <clears throat> and they and they try to put students by their predisposition. So if you're more of a strategy oriented person, they might put you with uh, finance and marketing uh, uh, to, to, to comprise a team of of people that are more like what you'll experience uh, when you go out into the working world, but but uh, the fact that we silo the 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 educational experience and then expect something different when they come into work um, is 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 really questionable. And, and obviously, <clears throat> the the change needs to be both at the uh, the university side where we've got to get more integration, more cross-discipline kinds of uh, activities going on, and then, again, for businesses to, uh, to support that when they come out and, and uh, uh, sort of have career paths and so on that allow people to, uh, to, to get uh, to integrate across those disciplines so that they can turn into to better future leaders and professionals. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Dr. Muhammad, for asking the question. Uh, let me move to another question. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, second. Uh, what would you recommend to an organization who wants to build an idea bank? How should one structure or filter out the inputs in an organized manner and equally reward the most creative ideas? You know, <clears throat> this is this is Norm. <clears throat> I think the answer to that is, I think uh, it, it can't just be one thing. I think, uh, first of all, I think the organization has to ask for it. I think in many organizations, the, the, there's people have learned to hear no to so many things 
that they stop trying to, uh, to, to contribute new ideas. But if you're going to do an idea bank, the first step would be, you know, at, at the most senior levels of the organization, go public, that, uh, that it's your intention to do that. And then I think what I've seen uh, a few organizations do, a few companies, is that, is that they start to measure the number of yeses rather than the number of no's. So what, what you want to see is, is the idea bank cross the next gate, right? So if you think about innovation gates, it starts with an idea, and then there's an ideation process leading through to commercialization. So, <clears throat> so somehow, that begin to uh, have a pipeline from the idea bank to commercialization and actually have measures that are, are transparent and uh, not only transparent, but actually push. I mean, we tell people that their ideas, where they are in the pipeline, how many ideas we have, how many of those ideas have turned into commercialization, and again, to reward people both uh, financially and non-financially. Non-financially is, is uh, obviously easier. Financially, if somebody had a great idea that led to uh, some you know, financial uh, benefit to the company, that there ought to be some kind of financial benefit to the, to the individual. And uh, again, I, I keep talking about this uh, workshop we're having in Utah where we've got these teams from different companies. I just heard a presentation from uh, 3M yesterday. 3M is, just has this legacy of innovation where the heroes in the company are the innovators uh, from the time of Art Fry who, uh, who, who, who worked on the, uh, the sticky note and thought it was uh, you know, a, uh, uh, something to uh, hold the bookmark, a, a bookmarker originally. So again, those would be some uh, simple ideas. Be transparent, uh, ask for it, measure success, and be and, and really communicate uh, where things are in the pipeline from the uh, from the idea bank through to commercialization. The, the thing I would add to that is um, you want you want a culture where people are 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 feel free to input and suggest and provide ideas. But you want to focus the when you think about the customer and the market and the organization strategy, you want to help frame those and filter those around your organization model, right? The product in, in the case of Samsung, you would like more ideas around the product platform and product innovation. In the case of uh, Amazon, you'd like your teams to be really looking at ideas around the distribution system and the alliances, et cetera. So. So helping the organization get clear about the focus of the ideas would, would help generate things that are more relevant to your strategy. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one last question we have. Time and again, companies are recommended to hire innovative people to do something new. From HR perspective, don't you think managing a fleet of such innovative staff could become challenging in administering routine operational tasks. Considering the reality of business norms in parallel, you do not want to end up having a demoralized staff who cannot continuously be challenged on innovation. That's a great question, right? And then, so if, if, if you are in fact going to hire innovative people, you need to have an innovative organization to keep them um, engaged, right, and to retain them. So. Uh, that's really what we're talking about here. With if, if you need to be able to align your leadership value and and their imperative, you need to be able to align your the design of your organization so so they have processes and places where they um, actually welcome the innovation. Um, you need to be able to train your people around the individual skills. And from the HR platform, we, we, we spend a lot of our time in design of HR systems to help support the strategy. Right? You've got to think through the whole recruit the, the strategy for recruitment, selecting, retaining, developing, right, and growing people have, have all got to be aligned to innovation. And um, the leadership team and managers have to be 
you know, on board and aligned with that process as well. So it, it, you're exactly right. If you if you if you brought if you started to hire a bunch of innovative people and you didn't have an organization aligned to do that, um, you would not be successful very long in keeping those people. I had a uh, my my first boss when I worked at Exxon. Uh, we we I remember fondly the day that he said that uh, bringing innovative people into the organization was like dancing with a gorilla. And if the gorilla starts to enjoy uh, the innovation process, you can't stop dancing. When you're done, you have to wait till the gorilla's done. So you create these expectations that we're going to be innovative and that we're, we're asking for an idea bank, we're hiring more innovative people, and as Joe said, if uh, and as the, the my old boss at Exxon was saying, you can't create those expectations and then not deliver on the promise, or you create. And the gorilla is the, the reason the metaphor for a gorilla works so well is that if, if you know you, the gorilla gets mad at you, you're in trouble, right? Uh, if you create expectations that you don't fulfill. It's, it's, it's not a good situation. You create, uh, things are worse than if you hadn't done it. But what's the alternative, right? The alternative is that you hire dull people, uncreative people who, who aren't innovative, and, and then what have you got, right? So somehow trying to align the organization and hiring the right kind of people where we hear you know, more yeses than noes about, uh, about their ideas and how we can try to work with them is, is where we're trying to get to. Well, uh, that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. I would like to thank you, Norm and Joe, for giving this wonderful presentation. Any concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? Um, thank you, Ali. Uh, we've enjoyed uh, putting this together. Um, we realize the, the enormous struggle that organizations are facing in, in today's marketplace and um, the, the kind of aspirations and intent of most employees and managers and professionals around succeeding the or, with the organization, helping the organization succeed. And we hope that um, kind of the framework we provide and some of the insights and tools can be helpful for you in a, in a simplest way of being able to move forward your, your dream of having a successful company. And we'd love to see some of you in, uh, or all of you actually, in, uh, in Dubai in September, or November. So uh, thanks for the opportunity here. Once again, thank you very much, uh, both of you, and for a very, very interesting presentation on innovation. Folks, uh, uh, a lot of you have been asking about how to download the presentation copy. I've already broadcast it on the chat box uh, on your webinar console at the right bottom, or you could uh, visit community.mile.org. This is what I'm illustrating. It has already been uploaded on our download section, so you can download it. We are also recording the webinar which will be updated or uploaded on the same community in the next couple of days so please stay tuned and thank you all of those for attending this webinar and for your questions you all have a good day good afternoon good evening wherever you're calling from assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship MILE